Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Queer Culture Club, our monthly short format interview series that focuses on LGBTQ people who are defining the queer culture of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. My name is Terry Beswick, and I'm the executive director of the Historical Society and the host and moderator for the Queer Culture Club. So tonight, I'm, I'm delighted to have a very special guest, a friend, Susan Stryker, a historian, writer, director, and producer who has helped to shape and define the cultural conversation on transgender topics for over 20 years. A former executive director of the Historical Society, she is best known for her pioneering archival research that rediscovered the 1966 Compton's Cafeteria Riot in San Francisco's Tenderloin District, which she explored with co-director Victor Silverman in the 2005 documentary Screaming Queens. Since then, she has co-produced, consulted on, or appeared in numerous high-profile projects exploring transgender history and culture. And with that, let's bring on our guest, Susan. Hey, hey. Terry. Great hey. to see you. Great to see you, too. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Feels uh, like coming home. <laughs> it does. I don't actually know. Are you in San Francisco right now? I, I am, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. And you were, yeah, you were in my role as executive director um, before there was StreamYard or YouTube or anything else like this, Facebook. Uh, I think it was around, what was it, 2000? 99 to 2003. I was like okay. one, one, one month shy of five years. Great. Well, you know, I, I definitely see the work um, in our organizational archives cropping up every now and then. And uh, thank you for laying the ground. I think you were the first executive director, actually, of the Historical it's, Society, right? It's, it's true. And yeah. uh, th thank you for, like, keeping the lights on and, the, <laughs> you know, everything r running. Well, I have a lot of help in that. But, yeah, thanks yeah. very much. Yeah. So, uh, Susan, I, uh, you know, I'm really interested because it's August, and every time when August rolls around, we think about the Compton's Cafeteria riots, and it made me think of you, and uh, I'm so glad that you are on the show now. We don't know the actual date of the Compton's Cafeteria riots, right? Um, that is correct. I mean, I, ha I have a, a best guess, but we don't have, um, yeah, we don't have, like, the, the smoking gun, so to speak. Right. And and maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, about why that is. But you know, I I, I mentioned in the introduction that you co-directed with Victor Silverman, uh, Screaming Queens, which I think has really been a seminal film for a lot of folks, but really an inspiration around the world uh, for transgender rights activism. Um, and because of that that event. Um, uh, that you uh, uncovered, um, and I think really it was through research that you were doing while you were executive director in the archives. Is that right? It was even before that. It was oh, when okay. I first started volunteering. I started volunteering at the Historical Society in 1991, and I joined the board in 1992. And um, when, by the later 90s, uh, I was actually at a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford and doing research at the archives on the film that became Screaming Queens. Um, and uh, that's when, you know, the, the, the organization kind of had a crisis about like, ah, oh, how are we gonna like pay rent during the dot-com boom? And I said, well, you know, maybe we need an executive director, you know, and not just a board and I'll step in and, and, and do that, you know, for a, a modest, you know, stipend the first year. But if it works, I want this to be my, I want this to be my job. And that's the way that it worked out. But the question about Compton's, you know, I, I was actually finishing up my, my dissertation, uh, my PhD program at, at, uh, at Berkeley in 1991. 1991-92, and I was starting to transition, and you know, uh, you know, it's like be, be, being trans in 91-92 wasn't like a great way to you know get a job as a history professor, and so I just thought, well, you know, got to do what I got to do, and uh, I'll figure out a way to be a historian, however I can, and I should get plugged into the historical society, and you know, do work on trans history. So that's what I did. And it was in 
that like really early on that um, I first heard about the Compton's cafeteria riot. And it, it was curious like, to me, like why it wasn't better known than it was. Um, because where where that story turns out was was first told was in the mm -hmm. centerfold of the program for the very first gay pride parade in San Francisco. And it was organized by Raymond Brochiers. It was called Christopher Street West San Francisco. And he's just, right? 72. 72, uh, I mean, okay. I mean, I mean, so Stonewall was 69. There was yeah. like a little impromptu thing in 70, okay. not much in 71. And then right. in 72, there wow. were people in LA who organized Christopher Street West, who basically right. said to people in San Francisco, it's like, hey, y'all, you should get with the program here. You should do something to commemorate Stonewall. And Ray Brochures said, okay, okay, I'll do that. And so he organized Christopher Street West San Francisco. And he mm -hmm. said, you know, it's like, hey, we're gathering this weekend to celebrate Stonewall, but don't forget, gay pride started in San Francisco three years earlier. It all began on a hot August night in 1966 when Queens, you know, rose up against the constant harassment of, you know, the, the police. And, you know, when the cops came in to raid Compton's, a cafeteria located at the corner of Turk and Taylor Streets. It's like, you know, one of the Queens threw her coffee in the cop's face and you know then all hell breaks loose and so you know why that story wasn't remembered it's like mm, we could go down that rabbit hole and you know talk about <laughs> why why i think it wasn't remembered uh but for for me how i first found it you know before i found the program itself i found a mention of the riot and a chronology of gay San Francisco that one of the founders of the organization, Greg Pennington, had put together. And, you know, for those of you who know oh. your historical society history, um, one of the projects that helped, you know, the, the historical society get off the ground was a project that Willie Walker and Greg Pennington had done to, like, collect all of the known um, LGBT publications in San Francisco, which like the, the public library wasn't collecting, the Bancroft Library at Berkeley wasn't collecting, Stanford wasn't collecting. And it was like, we've got to save our history ourselves. And so like they pulled together this massive periodicals collection mm -hmm. and Greg was going through them all and making this type script list of like events that had happened and, okay. you know, and so there was just this, you know, binder of pages, you know, organized chronologically. And it said, you know, August, 1966. And then it just said, um, uh, gay pride quarterly number one, um, drag queens protest at Compton's cafeteria corner of Turk and Taylor. It's like, mm, what, mm, what? Mm. Um, yeah. And it, and it was hard to find, you know, it was hard to find what Gay Pride Quarterly number one was because it turned out that's just the name that Walker had assigned to that program for the Pride mm -hmm. Parade. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, that that um, that was unnumbered and not called Gay Pride Quarterly. But then there was a Gay Pride Quarterly two and three and four that were done in the same format. And so mm -hmm. he, that's just what he called it, but it made it very difficult uh, to find, you know, when I was looking for something called Gay Pride Quarterly Number One, which didn't right. really exist. So, so uh, there, so there's these few fragments, and yeah. it would be it'd be interesting, and then some oral histories, right? Uh, which I take it were really their source materials. Is that right? Yeah, you know it. I mean, like that starting in like 91, 92, when I first found that mention in Greg Pennington's chronology, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in the archives throughout the 90s. And I just, you know, I was reading everything as it came in. I was helping process the collections. I was scanning all of those old periodicals and just looking for any clue that I could find mm -hmm. about trans history in general. Um, but then when I would see something that was about the Compton's 
riot, I would go like, oh, like here's a piece of the puzzle and I'd put it in a little folder. Yeah. And over time, uh, I was able to, um, you know, to kind of start putting the puzzle pieces together. So it's like or, a yeah. yeah, forensic detective work. Forensic like detective a lot of work. Fun. A lot it was of a lot of fun. And you're right, yeah. oral history was a part of it. I mean, oral history kind of helped provide the connective tissue uh mm -hmm. for some of the little you know nuggets of documentation that i could find but the other thing that was really important um you know when i first started working at the historical society we were located over on uh, 16th street in the redstone building right. um, but then we moved to uh, 973 market street between mm -hmm. 5th and 6th Couple doors and down from where we are now. Where you are now, right? And we could look out our windows into the tenderloin, you know, like over the tops of the buildings and into oh, the yeah. tenderloin. And there was um, there was also a volunteer who was working there. This guy named Damon Scott, who was a geographer, and he took all of these, um, you know, like I, I think it was Eric Garber who had put together a list of all known gay bars and businesses, you know, from mm -hmm. this periodicals collection. And Damon put it in an interactive map and generated this map of like where all these things were located. And you could really see the spatial pattern of like when there were like gay and trans, you know, businesses and bars and hotels when, mm. when they existed where, and that was where I really got this sense of like, oh wait, the Tenderloin was this incredibly important neighborhood for trans people. And, you know, it's like, I was able to do a kind of more like spatial or geographical analysis of the Tenderloin that let me see um, sort of the dynamics of the riot. It's like the story that Ray Brochier's told about Compton's, it just totally made sense that it happened there and then, you know? Wow. And so, you know, putting all of those layers together, you know, wow. I was able to go, well, by George, I think we had a riot. You know, <laughs> I think it actually happened pretty much like Brochier's said. Yeah, and then when yeah. Victor and I started doing work in progress screenings for Screaming Queens, mm -hmm. we initially thought we were going to do it as a, you know, kind of like a paper chase sort of movie. It's like trans mm -hmm. historian looks for a lost history of important event. And, you know, people would follow me on the quest mm -hmm. and then we wouldn't be able to pin it down, you know, exactly. And, to, mm -hmm. and that we were going to end with this sense of like, we think it happened and we think it happened just like this. And then we would do a mm -hmm. recreation. But as we were doing the work in progress screenings, um, Felicia Elizondo, who, you know, I had kind of known through the community, she was at one of the screenings and she says like, oh, if that's what you're making your film about, you need to talk to Amanda. She was there. And yeah. we found Amanda St. James, who was one of our lead you know, interviewees. Wow. And um, yeah, she, you know, she didn't, she didn't know what I knew. She didn't know the story that I had put together. And she just gave this like, knock your socks off interview that just corroborated everything that I had put together. And I, I really think she kind of became the heart and soul yeah. of the film. That, yeah. gives, that just gives me chills to uh, think about that, that, that point of discovery. I mean, after all that methodical work to actually sort of hit gold if you will you know? yeah it was the and, cherry uh, you know on top yeah. of the icing on top of the cake and of course we just recently lost uh, felicia uh, elizondo who uh, was such a key figure in the documentary as well and and i should mention we posted a, a she did an event with us at the museum a couple of years ago and posted it on our our uh, our website if people are curious to take a look at that um where she just talks about you know, living in the tenderloin back in the day. Um, so, so, and and we so there's the Compton's cafeteria riots, San Francisco. Of course, there were other uh, 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 fights against police oppression in Los Angeles and other cities, and certainly Stonewall in New York. But uh, but Stonewall it has kind of become. Um, I, I mean, Compton's has become our kind of our Stonewall. Um, I mean, it, it, in, in particular for transgender folks um, and uh, an inspiration for many different kinds of projects, actually. 
Uh, but in particular, the uh, transgender district um, has uh, initially it took the name of Compton's uh, Cafeteria right. Transgender District, and uh, uh, and I think that they chose to take Compton's out because Compton's was actually part of the oppressor, <laughs> right? Or represented yeah, the and oppressor. they didn't want to name it after a you know a private business. They wanted to name it after the the community, and I think that's right. that's absolutely appropriate. Yeah, and yeah. so what is the what is the how how do what is the district? Uh, signify for you um, in the in this you know in the in the context of the history of the tenderloin in particular well i mean the 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 district does all kinds of things and i don't want to speak on b behalf of it it's like you know like talk to aria Said and you know jupiter you know peraza who are, who are there uh, you know look no, at the website just the, for all of the things yeah. that, that they do but for me it's yeah, kind of like yeah. it makes me very happy that um there was work that i did as a trans historian to recover something about trans history that then becomes this in and of itself this historically significant way of honoring the the history and legacy and presence of trans people as a worthwhile and important part of the social fabric, you know, it's like um, at one level, it's a symbolic gesture, but at another level, it's like making it a cultural district that's officially recognized by the city of San Francisco. It's like becomes a way of leveraging uh, resources, you know, both tangible and intangible for um, bettering the quality of trans life and for doing public ed education about trans issues. So, you know, I, I feel like, mm, this this is this is the shows the power of public storytelling. You know, it's just like I, I, the story was significant to me. I thought it would be significant to other people. I found a way to tell the story as publicly as I could to as many people as I could. The story landed. It changed how people thought about things, and one of the outcomes of that was the creation of the the trans district. Right, and cultural districts in San Francisco are defined by legislation, and the transgender culture district was one of the first that was recognized by the city. And so, uh, uh, and they're intended to do a lot of a lot of things around preservation and historic commemoration, and but also uh, a revitalization of of a living culture, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so it, it is a work in progress. I mean, we're we're learning, you know what we want to do with the cultural districts and, and uh, uh, how we can leverage funds uh, to make a difference in people's lives. Yeah, and I'll tell you one thing that I would love to see the district do. I mean, they've looked into this, it would be a daunting uh, project, but that building at the corner of Turk and Taylor Streets that housed yeah. Compton's Cafeteria, um, that was the ground floor commercial space of, a, of an SRO hotel. And starting in the late 80s and early 90s, um, as you know, San Francisco was experiencing a, a previous wave of gentrification, uh, that building had, you know, its owners had kind of let it go derelict. There'd been a couple of fires in the building, some one of them at least suspicious. You know, um, the building was condemned, then it was purchased, and the new purchasers in the 90s um, turned it into a private for-profit incarceration facility. Uh, right. It became a, a, a so-called residential re-entry facility for people who were exiting incarceration and preparing to return to post-incarcerated life. And the building right. is now owned by Geo Group, which is one of the world's largest private prison companies. They're the same people who, you know, do the, you know, kids in cages down on the, the southern border. They run ice facilities. It's like they're, you know, in my humble opinion, like a, just like geo is how you spell evil with three letters. You know, right. it's, and so wouldn't it be cool, you know, um, especially given the fact that the state of California through AB 32 has, um, you know, it's like said no more private prisons. And it's like by, by I think 2028, it, it's like ex ones that exist, like there, there can be no new contracts right now. And by 2028, right. Um, you know, existing facilities have to be gone. Wouldn't it be cool if, you know, 
by leveraging the, the trans district's status as a cultural heritage district mm -hmm. that we could pull together public or public and private funds to purchase that building, turn it into low income housing, turn it into you know, a cultural facility of some kind and did nonprofit yeah. office space. So you like reopen a cafeteria to like be job training for people yeah. who need job training. You know, I could um, I could see that building becoming a really significant structure in the city. I mean, something like the women's building in, in the mission, something on that scale. Yeah. yeah and we've, we've talked around this for a few years now and um and i applaud you to uh keep bring bringing it up into the conversation is it is kind of a a serendipitous thing that you know that there's a need mm -hmm. um and there is this building which is being used for uh as you say evil purposes and uh well you know um, it does it does serve people who are there but it's like it shouldn't be it's for part, profit it shouldn't be for profit yeah, you know right. and it should be done but it, it's like pe people who are exiting incarceration may need support and they should get support but i don't think it should be done the way that it is being done now yeah it's i mean it's kind of it is you know it, it's a facility we're not really talking about the policies that they that, that they use in running the facility or how they're served and you know there, i mean there's a question around you know when you move people out of prison that you want to have them in an urban environment where they can have access to other services and jobs and that kind of thing um so that may be appropriate but it's for profit um and, yeah, and it's poor and, quality and, it's poor quality and it's for profit it's exploitative it's violent and it just shouldn't it shouldn't be done that way and it's and so. it's going to and it's going to be illegal very soon in california yeah. to, to have yeah. so uh, so and but more importantly this is a historically significant site so yeah it would be great um i'd love to work with you on that um as we seek opportunities going forward you know uh well, and well, well, speaking of seeking opportunities going <laughs> forward, I have yeah. heard through the grapevine that um, there's like a, you know, the museum project at the Historical yes. Society. Maybe, yeah. um, you know, getting a little, getting a little boost. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, we've been working on this for several years. Um, uh, this idea of establishing what would be the first full-scale museum of LGBTQ history. Uh, in the country are really outside of Berlin. And, uh, 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 and, you know, so we've done a lot of feasibility studies, a lot of work around that. And you're, you're actually uh, still co-chair of our national advisory council. I, um, <laughs> I am aware. And, and, and uh, uh, yeah, so we were very pleased this last June, uh, Mayor Breed proposed uh, $12 million uh, to purchase a building uh, for, uh, an LGBTQ history museum, um, and uh, ten is to purchase, and two million is to rehab it if we purchase an existing building, for example. Um, and the board of supervisors approved it, and now we're just waiting and working through the uh, the city process to, you know, uh, figure out where and how and when. And uh, we have still a lot of money to raise around that. But you're also on the board of directors for the New York. Uh, what is it called? The American LGBTQ Plus Museum. The American Museum of LGBTQ Plus History. Okay. Oh, from yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we've we've spent a lot of time talking about names within uh, the GLBT Historical Society, so I, I I I can imagine the process that went into uh, coming up with that. But um, and there's a lot of news uh, around that project, right? Um, yeah. uh, uh, partnering yeah. with the New York Historical Society, and there's going to have a couple of floors on their new annex in Manhattan that is going to be mm -hmm. dedicated to uh, queer history uh, exhibitions and programming. So that's exciting. So what do you think? I mean, is it a, is it a race between New York and San Francisco? I think it's a rising it's a rising tide that lifts all boats. That's what I think. You know, there's another project in Fort Lauderdale uh, in Florida. Yeah. You know, that's also trying to like launch a big museum project. Right. I just think the 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 broader cultural recognition of the need for an LGBTQ museum of some kind. It's just, it's just in the zeitgeist right now. It's like, it's something yeah. that people feel like it's like, why don't we have one of those? Right. And, yeah. you know, I, I think 
I think there can be more than one, you know, like I think of it as a field, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it, what we're essentially talking about, I think in New York, Florida, San Francisco, the, the one Institute in LA, like all of the larger, um, queer historical organizations. Um, you know, I think what we're basically saying is that we see opportunities for like more resources to do more accessible, higher profile, more robust public storytelling and exhibitions, and that we sense a need for that. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be involved in more than one organization if I thought that it was a conflict of interest. You know, I mean, <laughs> GLBT Historical Society is near and dear to my heart. You know, I'm a California girl and, um, you know, and, you know, I totally support what's happening in San Francisco. And in New York, it's like, I see a bunch of like really well-connected uh, people with a lot of fundraising capacity who've been you know, successful in, you know, many other things that they've done, you know, like with the community center or, you know, AIDS fundraising or, you know, civil rights and social justice activism. And I really think, you know, they've got legs, you know, and I think it's really, I think it's really interesting that they have like hit this new benchmark. Maybe I should say we have hit a new benchmark. Um, at the same time that the historical society that you, and maybe I should say we have hit a new benchmark in San Francisco. It's just like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's cool that this is yeah. both happening at the same time. And, you know, I, I see one of my roles in this, it's like, you know, we're wearing two hats as, as being part of really trying to make sure that these, at least these two high profile projects, um, play nice with each other, you know, it's yeah. like, so that, you know, it's like, I can go back and forth and that what I keep telling my colleagues in New York is that, cause, that, cause like, I really do think they've got the capacity to raise a significant amount of money is to say what we need to think about doing is building relationships with existing organizations, don't reinvent the wheel, you know, forge partnerships where people can share resources, you know, like put put the money that we're raising into things that are like, you know, like union catalogs of all, you know, archival holdings and inventories of, you know, physical objects so that we all know what it is that we've got. And whether yeah. or not we're doing different programs in different locations, it's like we just all need to, you know, act like we're all in the same business of, of queer public history storytelling. Well, we, yeah, that's very well said. And, and, and we are in the same business. And, and I, I often say that, well, there should be a, a major museum of LGBTQ history in every major American city, if mm -hmm. not smaller ones, you know, um, and, uh, and or archives, um, you know, so there's a lot of conversations happening around collaboration among all the different uh, uh, queer uh, public history institutions around around the country, and and uh, but it does seem very timely. I mean, uh, you were working on that that project twenty plus years 20 ago. Years, twenty plus years ago, and you know, a little ahead of your time, I think. You know, well, you but, know, uh, when I was when I was at the historical society, um, and I was researching the his the history of the organization. You know, I was looking at some of the minutes of those early meetings at the SFPL that, be, you know, it's like, okay, like these are the people. So like, let's found an organization called the Gay and Lesbian Historical Society. Right. In those conversations, people were talking about the need for a museum. Yeah, you know, yeah, that was yeah, in like yeah. the mid 1980s, you know? Yeah. And then when, um, when, um, um, when I became executive director, it's like, yeah, that was very much part of the strategy that I had to like, how, how can we like get money? Cause we need money. Um, you know, I, I kind of put it to the board at the time of saying like, you know, one of our problems is that, you know, people think history is boring. It's like, we say archives. And if they think, if they even know what that is, they think, you know, Ba gray boxes of you know old musty papers it's not exciting but what's exciting is the story that's in them you know right. and yeah. that oh, we yeah. we need to like 
we need to like raise money and like reorient what we're doing to the the real public facing part of of the archive. You know, it's like we need to like think of ourselves and I, I was suggesting rather than thinking of ourselves as an archive that does exhibits, we should think of ourselves as a burgeoning museum that has a research center in it. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that was, I mean, that's the way I was thinking about it back in the yeah. day. And I'm glad that you're getting some traction with that idea finally. Well, I'm glad. Well, and thank you for your help with it also. I mean, uh, all, all throughout the years and, you know, creating these stories that we can continue to tell. And, yeah, you know, we're just about out of time. And I know that you and Mimi want to go have your dinner and watch. It's you know, true. Uh, <laughs> and I, just like one quick thing. I see that Steve K has sent a question. Do yeah, I so, think that the participants in the Compton's Cafeteria Riot knew that they were participating in an historic event? It's like, I don't know, honestly. It's like, I certainly think it was a historic event, but I kind of get the sense from the people I talked to who were there and, you know, the way it kind of sank without a trace that they were thinking of like, they were just experiencing police harassment and they basically mm -hmm. said, fuck you, stop doing that. It's just like, you know, like, and they got up in the cop's face, you know, yeah. and then they walked it back a little bit and then people just sort of went on with their life, you know? Um, it was like saying, hey, stop that. And like, like, oh, oh yeah. And they stopped for a little while. Yeah. And did they think it was historic? I mean, they thought it was necessary. You know, I love Amanda's line in the film when she was describing the riot. She says there was a lot of people who went to jail, but there wasn't also a lot of, I just don't give a damn, this is what needs to happen. You know, yeah. and there was a lot of joy after it happened, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, um, I think it, that's often, I think, people's experience when when they're involved in a historically significant event is that it's only in hindsight years later that they recognize that it may have even been a, a pivotal moment, you yeah. know. Yeah, but, you know, it, 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 to compare and contrast Compton's and Stonewall, I mean, yeah. I think within about two weeks of Stonewall, which, you know, was bigger and involved far more people and went on for far longer. I mean, it was a, a bigger event than Compton's. It was the same kind of event, but at a larger scale. Mm -hmm. But one of the, the, the real differences is that within just a couple of weeks of the Stonewall rebellion, uh, there were people involved in it who were saying, we're going to organize around this. It's like, we are going to plan a year out Christopher Street Liberation Day. You know, there's going to be a march. There's going to be a rally. Right. And they did a year long campaign of organizing, not just in New York, but nationally. It's like it was related mm -hmm. to the, the formation of the Gay Liberation Front. Mm -hmm. You know, there were there were there were organizing on college campuses. There was organizing and, you know the you know different cities yeah. and it was almost like from the beginning stonewall was imagined as something to be remembered and compton's was imagined as like something to say like hey don't treat me like that right and yeah that's a big difference yeah and it's also uh i think important um to recognize for a lot of folks even in the lgbtq community uh uh there's not a great awareness of the importance of our own history. Um, and it, it feels like our, our own history is fairly recent um, uh, in the context of, you know, the scope of, of history. And, and so getting people to like recognize its importance and explaining to them why the stories need to be preserved and, and shared is a big part of our job um, and, uh, and, 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 a, and a big justification for these very expensive museums that we're proposing, right? Yep, yep. And uh, so, yeah, so the work continues. Um, the work continues. And Susan, we could talk for a lot longer and I'm sure we, we will. It's just well, not gonna be on camera, so. <laughs> have, me, have me back sometime. And uh, okay. as we prepare to get off, it's like, I'm, I'm actually doing another, this being August in San Francisco, I'm doing another Compton's talk at the Tenderloin Museum next oh, great. week. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, if you have people listening, watching who, you know, just can't get enough Compton's, um, join us next week at the Tenderloin Museum. Um, yeah, I think we're going to cross promote that actually okay. on, on, our, yeah. on our social media. Yeah. So, uh, 
Uh, thank you so much, Susan. Is there anything else you want to announce? Um, just saying, I, you know, I, I'm, t I'm teaching uh, these days at Mills College after many yeah. years away from the Bay Area. I mean, I've always lived here, but I've worked in other cities and used airplanes to go to my job. Uh, yeah. I'm living back here full time now, teaching at Mills College. And one of the things that I do there is I run a monthly trans studies speaker series will be starting up in september so um go check that out at mills um and uh yeah you know that that's probably enough you know so it seems like we're, we're we're over time and i should shut up um <laughs> but thank you thank you for having me on it's always well, a pleasure for your time. Yeah. yeah it is and I, I hope to see you around soon and I'm thank around. you Lisa, for, for doing our tech work behind the scenes. And with yes. that, thank you thank everyone you, for ladies. listening. Thank um, you, audience. Thank you, our members and supporters. And have a good night. Great. See you next month when we're going to have Mimi. De, uh, Mimi from the Our Family Coalition is going to be my guest. So uh, look that up. Thanks. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.